what I'm going to be talking about today is sort of a follow-up on some earlier theoretical and computational work that we had done, applying an idea that comes from sort of statistics and applied math called compressed sensing uh, to doing biology, molecular biology, but kind of all biology, it turns out. Um, and the basic concept is, you know, biological systems are highly structured. And so the question is, if we're trying to learn how those systems work, can we leverage that structure, not just when we're doing analysis, but at the time of data collection, in order to collect far smaller amounts of data, but still learn a large amount of information. And this is a very general idea, because it just applies to how do you collect data and then learn from it. So as I said, um, could be applied in many different domains of biology. In particular, what I'm gonna talk about today and what we're working on at the moment is applying this idea to study uh, physiology, um, both in terms of histology, that is looking at tissues and understanding how they're structured and how they work, and also in terms of understanding cell circuitry, um, in particular by doing genetic perturbations, so breaking different parts of the cell and trying to figure out how different pathways work. Mostly I'm gonna be focusing on the imaging, um, but we're working on both, and if we get to it uh, with plenty of time left at the end, I'll talk about uh, genetic perturbations, but you can also find me um, to talk about it after. Okay, to actually get into the talk, as I said, a lot of biology proceeds by collecting large amounts of high-dimensional data and then looking for patterns in that data. We heard talks about um, that we're doing similar things this morning. Last week's talks were very much related to this idea. Uh, we've got various publications. Everyone's got publications where you collect lots and lots of data and look for patterns and essentially find some sort of low dimensional uh, or smaller, more compact and interpretable representation. But basically, whenever you collect data, you can always do this. Um, and the reason you can always do it is because the biological systems really are structured, right? And so that structure manifests in the data and that's what we look for. What I would like to do is to leverage, as I said, that structure at the time of data collection. So uh, about a year ago, we published a paper showing how one could use something called composite measurements, and I'll get into what these actually are, in order to more efficiently study gene expression profiling. Um, this was largely theoretical. We did a lot of simulations. And now what we're doing is actually applying this idea to increase multiplexing capability in imaging studies and also to increase uh, our ability to study cell circuits through genetic perturbations. So um, just as specific examples, in tissue imaging, you know, in order to learn how tissues work, um, one way that we can do it is just look at them under a microscope without labeling any sort of genes. Another way we can do it is dissociate all the cells within a tissue and study their gene expression levels in dissociated populations, either in bulk or in single cell. Uh, but to really understand all the relationships between different cell types and gene expression patterns, we'd like to observe those things in C2. Ideally, we'd be able to take any histological sample and look at the expression of all 20,000 genes, okay? And it'd be nice if we could do that either at the RNA or the protein level. There are many different methods that are being developed to do this, um, but suffice to say that we really can't do it at scale yet, especially in sort of any sample that we'd like to apply it to. What we'd like to do is, for example, be able to collect a small number of images in any given sample, which we can currently do, and yet make inferences about a much larger number of variables. So for example, collect something like a 10 color image, but learn uh, uh, 50 colors, um, 50 genes worth of spatial expression patterns. We'd like to apply the same ideas to study combinatorial mutations, okay, in order to understand how, um, as I said, cell circuits work or to understand uh, any bit of human genetics that is beyond sort of linear additive models. Um, we need to be able to have a framework for observing combinatorial mutations and modeling their effect on some phenotype. The most basic phenotype that we study is fitness, but we'd also like to be able to study more complicated or high dimensional phenotypes. And the problem is, uh, combinatorial perturbations grow at combinatorial scale. So, you know, at some point, if I'd like to perturb, let's say, you know, take all 20,000 genes and perturb all combinations of mm, 15 of them simultaneously, you know, there's like literally, if we took every cell on the planet and Aviv 
dissociated them all, and we did single cell sequencing in each one, and each one of those was a separate experiment. There's not enough cells on the planet uh, in order to do that experiment, right? If you treated each cell as one specific combination, um, then we still wouldn't even have enough cells. So it's not a matter of just like doing more single cell sequencing. There's a heck of a lot we can get out of doing more single cell sequencing, but there are certain fundamental problems like understanding how combinatorial mutations manifest in disease um, that we need sort of new fundamental paradigms for, and this is one idea that can get at that. Uh, finally, there's a whole bunch of other experiments that I have in mind that will use similar ideas. A very cool one is studying evolution. You can think about uh, evolution as occurring, of course, through a random process, but also through sort of a random composite process. So for example, if we're studying genetic mutations, the way we do it in the lab right now is we mutate gene number one and measure its phenotype. And then we mutate gene number two and measure its phenotype. And then we mutate the pair gene one, gene two, and measure that phenotype. And we do every single such combination individually. Evolution most certainly does not work like that. If it did, we wouldn't be here, right? Because that takes too damn long, okay? And so they do essentially evolution you can view as working through a sort of composite process. There's just a bunch of random stuff that happens all together at once, and you could even think about selective forces as being sort of random compositions of selective forces. What we don't do in the universe is take every genotype and isolate it in one specific selective regime and measure its fitness, and then put it in a different selective regime and measure its, its fitness. You have like a whole bunch of forces just randomly combining on any given organism in any given time frame, and then its fitness turns out to be whatever it is. So I think it's a particularly cool idea to take some of these same notions of composite -y stuff, compressive e stuff, and apply it to understanding how uh, life comes to be. But that's a topic for another year. Right. I mostly said all this. The summary of the rest of the talk is that it turns out you can learn a heck of a lot about biological systems uh, by collecting even random composite data. Some specific examples, you can learn like how genes are co-regulated or you can learn which genes are co-functional. Uh, but I think I'll just start to get into um, the actual idea. Specifically, what we're going to be doing is combining a lot of work that people have already done and I'm just tying together in both molecular biology and genetics and in mathematics. The specific ideas that we're bringing in from mathematics are, as I said, compressed sensing, but also sort of a fundamental theorem called the johnson linden strauss lemma, which has all sorts of applications. Uh, and I'll get into both of these. First of all, um, compressed sensing, uh, just to introduce this idea. Um, I said that biological systems are highly structured, but there's a lot of data that is highly structured. So for example, images are extremely structured, which you may have encountered um, if you've ever used an iPhone or looked at an image, frankly. Um, images are all basically stored in a compressed representation. So here's a photo of one of my dogs with extremely muddy paws. And originally on my iPhone, uh, this is like an eight megapixel photo, which would occupy tw 24 megabytes on disk. Um, but the iPhone doesn't want to take up that much disk space. So what it does is it stores only sort of the spatial frequencies in the data that are kind of relevant to human cognition, which it doesn't know what's relevant to human cognition. But basically, the information is contained in a small number of coefficients, and you can basically get the same image quality out with 100 times reduction in data size. Because you know the color and intensity of every pixel in this photo doesn't vary independently from all the other pixels. It's super structured in like fields like this, and, and there's the muddy paw zone, and the floorboard zone, and so on. So um, that's extremely useful for storing data. We don't actually have to store all of this data to get a high quality image. We can store just 1% of the data and yet still render a high quality image. But it turns out compressed sensing describes how if you know this is going to be true, that the data you're collecting are highly structured, you can actually acquire the image in a compressed format and then decompress it when you're ready to view it. So when we compress this thing on disk, the thing that's stored on disk you know, looks like nonsense, basically. It's some compressed representation of the data. And then we run a decompression algorithm, and it spits out an image. Now what we want to do is instead of collecting the data that actually makes sense, we want to 
collect the data that's some small amount of stuff that looks like nonsense, and then run a decompression algorithm and spit out that something that looks real. We just want to do it for biology instead of for images. So um, here's a little bit of uh, 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 rectangles uh, <laughs> that sort of describes the basic idea. People are uh, familiar, I guess, with a gene expression matrix. Okay, so suppose we had a gene expression matrix, one column per sample and one row per gene. Uh, very frequently, as I said in the beginning, one could decompose this to describe any given sample in terms of the activity of a small number of gene modules. Okay, there's a million different algorithms for doing this. You could do it in nonlinear space, linear space, whatever, whatever. Um, but the point is, you can usually describe a sort of high dimensional gene expression vector for a sample with a small number of parameters. So now what we'd like to do is instead of collecting all this data and then decomposing it after the fact, we'd like to take our gene expression matrix and now in each sample collect a small amount of data, use this data to infer which gene modules were active, and because we know there's a small number of gene modules that are active, then we only need a small amount of data, right? So for example, if I collected three rectangles per sample, but I had to learn, whatever that is, 20 rectangles, three is decidedly smaller than 20, and so that's a hard problem to solve. It's underdetermined. You basically can't solve it without any additional assumptions. However, if I collect three rectangles of data, and I know that only three of these, these are pretty much squares, three squares are non-zero, three is close to three, and so basically this is enough data to infer this. That's the cartoon version of why this problem works, that we actually only need to recover a small number of coefficients, and a small amount of data will suffice to do that. So then, once I've estimated which gene modules are active in any given sample, I run the decompression algorithm, which in this case is just take my inferred W matrix and multiply it by a known gene module dictionary, and that spits out an estimate of what the full gene expression profile should be. Yeah. yeah. So in addition to knowing the three values of the three non-zeros, you have to know which of the three are non-zero. And so is essentially the extra bit no pun intended, that that's a, just, that's a, it's a big number, but it's a finite number of possibilities. So a, even one additional real number has enough information potentially to uncover that as well. Yeah, so, so what you exactly, so if there's, um, let's actually count this time, there's eight different rows here. And let's say we know that only three of them are active. The number of possibilities that we need to distinguish is eight choose three. And the amount of data that we need to collect is basically log of eight choose three. Okay, so that's, that's how the scaling works out. So it's linearly proportional to the three, and it's a log of the eight, because it's eight to the three is the scale of eight choose three. Something like that, okay? Okay, that's the cartoon scheme. Now, I've been saying we want to collect compressed data. What does that actually mean? Mathematically, what it means is we want to collect a measurement. We want to capture a measurement that represents a linear combination of gene abundances, if we're applying this to measure gene abundances. So for example, composite measurement number one, or composite gene number one, mathematically, should represent some weighted sum of all 20,000 genes. And I could define a second composite measurement using a different weighted sum of all 20,000 genes. So mathematically, it's not too complicated. And, uh, and again, the idea is that the number of uh, such composite genes that we collect is much smaller than the total number of genes. What does that actually look like? Well, here's a composite slide, OK? So, the data that we want to collect are like basically the molecular equivalent of this mess. So this is just whatever, some random subset of my first 10 slides all smashed together. Here's a different random subset. And the rest of the talk is going to, no, I'm just joking. Um, 
But this is literally what we want to collect. And it looks like nonsense. And it looks like, why would you ever go about doing that? Well, it turns out because we have these very strong mathematical theorems that if you write it down in this sort of neat form and say, I know what the weights were, but I just want to recover these things via the gene modules and so on, it's all going to work out very nicely, despite the fact that just like if I were to take a, uh, the compressed data from an image and look at it, it wouldn't look like an image. It would look like a mess. Here's a compressed slide. It looks like a mess. Um, but if we know sort of what those weights were, that is to say, this slide was composed of my title slide and slide number three and whatever, and this slide was composed of whatever, slides number one, seven, and eight. Um, and in this case, the, the sort of uh, underlying representation of presentation space would be like each individual slide is made up of kind of a finite dictionary of elements, right? So if I'm trying to reconstruct what slide number three would have been like, um, the dictionary I'm choosing from is a dictionary of elements that are like you get dog pictures, you get slide titles, and you get rectangles or something like that. And we're doing the same thing, but with gene modules instead of you know, slide dictionary elements. So that's what a composite slide looks like. What, what might a composite experiment look like? Well, um, the result of a composite experiment should basically tell you kind of the average, uh, if you like, a weighted average outcome of individual experiments. So one could do this computationally. Suppose you knocked out gene number one and measured the outcome. The outcome could be a gene expression profile. And then knocked out gene number two in a separate experiment and measured the outcome. And then you just computationally took the average. We want to, instead of doing both those separately, just do one experiment and read out the outcome that's the same thing. The way it turns out you can do that is you just take cells where you knocked out gene number one and cells where you knocked out gene number two put them in the same tube, and now just measure the bulk expression profile. And if those two cells haven't interacted with each other, then basically the RNA that you get out is kind of the, the net RNA from those two experiments put together, uh, which is the same as just computationally averaging them. So that's, um, that's how like a, combination, uh, a, a perturbation experiment would look. Now, we can also talk about, for doing imaging studies, what would a composite image look like? And you can think about composite images in part of a sort of natural progression of how imaging studies have been evolving over the years. So um, not originally, but originally on this slide, the way uh, imaging was done is basically through in situ hybridizations, you would have one tissue section. And in any given tissue section, you are allowed to measure one gene. OK? And these are three genes that will reappear on some later slides. OK? So these are three different tissue sections from the same region, in this case of a mouse brain, mouse motor cortex. There are more recently developed studies where, in any given region, you could actually use multiple channels uh, to measure several genes simultaneously. So for example, we might image four genes on four different fluorescent channels. And we could get them simultaneously, excuse me, in the same tissue section. Then there have been even further improvements upon that, where you could repeat this process over multiple cycles of imaging. So you could image four genes in a given tissue section, strip off all that signal, stain with probes for a next set of four genes, and repeat this process through several cycles. Uh, now, you can't continue going forever and ever. Um, your tissue will start to degrade for one thing, but also it takes a long time. These things can take, you know, like on the order of a day per cycle for some, uh, some technologies. Nonetheless, these are extremely powerful, right? You can image uh, what we hadn't been able to do before. You can now image, say, like a dozen or so genes in the same tissue, and we can learn a heck of a lot from that. In a composite image, we're going to build on this, but now each channel in any given cycle is just going to tell me the net abundance of some subset of genes, right? So in cycle number one, I might throw in blue fluorescent probes for genes 1, 3, 7, 13, and 14. 
And in the same cycle of imaging, I might throw in red fluorescent probes for genes 4, 6, so on and so on. Okay? So it's just kind of a natural extension. We're just including multiple probes instead of a single target per channel. Yeah? Um, you making any assumptions about the independence of those gene sets in each channel? Or does there, do they need to be independent? What happens if they're very correlated and always in the same cell uh, or things like that? Yeah, so um, we want uh, our measurements to be so genes are going to be repeat. There's two parts to the question. Um, any given gene might appear you know, in multiple measurements. Like gene 3 might appear in the yellow channel in cycle 3 as well. So we might have redundant measurements of any given gene. But then there's also the question of, how did I pick this particular combination? Okay, Do you have to be smart somehow? And answer number one is no. Um, it turns out you can pick them randomly. And that does a pretty good job. Um, answer number two is, eh, being smart doesn't hurt. And so if you have some training data, which we do for especially the pilot studies where we just want things to work, um, then you can kind of use that training data to pick compositions that look like they're going to do a particularly good job of sampling from different parts of gene module space, basically. A brief follow-up. I didn't quite catch that the first time that one gene could be in multiple channels. Yeah. Is that a, is that an important part yes. of the design? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's the that's the idea is um, we would like to go collect composite images that are designed of this sort. We're gonna think of those as like the compressed representation of our data and do something like when it's really scaled up, it might be nice to say use 10 cycles of four color imaging, so that would be like a 40 channel image of the same tissue section. That would be 40 composite images and sort of decompress that to infer hundreds or maybe even a thousand different protein levels in the case of measuring protein. For RNA, we'd like to scale it up even more. Um, so that's what we're shooting for. Um, and we're not there, but I will show you the results of some of our pilot studies. In a first pilot study, um, we thought, it would be nice uh, in mouse motor cortex, where we have some good experimental protocols working, uh, we'd try to measure 37 different genes in the same tissue section. Okay, So these are the genes. The genes were chosen because they're uh, you know, uh, particularly good markers of the different cell types listed, and because they're kind of expressed in similar ranges, those, though there's still a decent amount of variability between them. So here's what some of those data look like. These are not yet composite images. This is just still um, one channel per gene. So for example, uh, in the red channel of um, this image, we have somatostatin. Uh, in green, we have p-valve. And in blue, we have GAD1. Okay? Um, and these are just to explain these like lines right here. These are just nine different fields of view that I stitched together. Um, somewhat lazily. So sometimes there's these lines and sometimes there's not. So that way you don't have to ask me about what those lines are when they sometimes are there and sometimes they're not. Okay, but anyway, so th these are nuclei in the mouse brain that you're seeing lit up here, not nuclei, cells. Um, and these genes uh, are all basically expressed in interneurons. GAD1 is kind of a very broad marker for inhibitory neurons. And these um, genes are kind of two different specific subtypes of inhibitory neurons. And so you can see that these sort of data look reasonable, that um, anytime you have either red or green, you also have GAD1. That's good. That's what we sort of knew from previous biology, that these should be subsets of these neurons. So for example, you know, you have purple, which is SST and GAD1 quite often, but never really just red. And same thing for teal, um, which is p-valve and GAD1, but never just green. But then you have some cells that are neither of these subsets, and those are just GAD1. The blue's a little bit hard to see. Okay. Again, these are still just individual genes. Um, that was an example where they're um, all different. It's just like subtypes of the same type of neuron. We also have some markers for entirely different types of cells. So now I'm showing, again, GAD1 in red, 
Um, we have a marker of olig oligodendrocyte precursor cells in green and a marker of endothelial cells shown up in blue. Okay, so um, these are kind of what the images look like when you measure individual genes. Um, the problem is if we wanted to capture all 37 genes with this sort of cyclic method, um, that would take, uh, we use three colors here, 13 rounds of three color imaging. And um, for one thing, that takes quite a long time, about well, almost two weeks, um, but also the tissue just degrades. So you sort of can't, this is like maybe at the boundary of what we can do, maybe just slightly beyond right now. Um, our goal is to recover the images for all 37 genes um, from just 10 composite images. So we're gonna collect uh, three color imaging in just four rounds of cyclic fish and try and um, uh, get the same amount of information. I'm, this work is being done together with a fabulous collection of people. Um, some of the sort of selection of these marker genes I did together with Asan, um, and then all of the actual work, which I basically contribute to very little, uh, is being done by these folks, Evan um, and Anu, who work together with Faye, Anu is also in Ed Boyden's lab, and Brooke, who works in the Lander lab, and John also, who works in the Regev lab. So the basic pipeline, is as follows. <clears throat> We're going to collect single cell RNA sequencing data in the tissue to be imaged. Not, doesn't have to be the exact same one, but in the same tissue region, for example. And we're gonna use that to learn about the different gene expression patterns, to learn gene modules, okay? We're also gonna do some simulations, that is, we're gonna pretend to be smart, and we're gonna say, if my measurement compositions were whatever, pick some measurement compositions, um, then how good would I be at recovering the full gene expression profile? So we're gonna simulate in just uh, single cell dissociated data, if instead of having all 37 gene abundance levels, if I just had 10 sort of composite gene levels, and then I ran the decompression through the inference of the gene modules, how good would a particular um, set of you know, composite measurements perform? So we just do that simulation to pick a good one, like I said, because it's a pilot study. Um, when the numbers are bigger, that is when you're measuring more genes and collecting more composite data, um, it's a little bit less important that you uh, attempt to be smart and doing random things is, um, is basically closer in terms of performance. Then, um, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, so that's our training data, we know what the gene modules are, we're gonna uh, generate composite images, um, then the idea is any, in any given small region of this image corresponding to one cell, I have some sort of composite signal intensity, and I'd like to infer what the individual um, gene intensities are. So just to sketch out what that looks like, um, so we have, let's say, a 10-channel image, right? There's three, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so this is a 10-channel image. First of all, is this, this is clear what I mean by like a 10-channel image? Sort of clear? It means that I picked um, 10 different combination, well, maybe I can just show you on the next slide, actually. Oh, no, this keyboard. No, this one, okay. So it means that, for example, in image number one or channel number one, I'm gonna put in probes for this set of genes. Okay, so the, the net intensity that I'm looking at, let's call this channel number one, corresponds to red in round one of imaging. So on the red channel in round one of imaging, I had probes for all of these genes simultaneously. So I don't know where any of these genes are individually, but I know sort of the net intensity of all of them together. And when I say I'm gonna generate a 10 channel image, it means I just did that sort of 10 times across the different colors and in the different rounds of sequencing. So that's my input. The way the decompression works is that, um, well, as I said, Conceptually, what you might like to do is for any region of the image corresponding to one cell, you might take as a vector that sort of 
length 10 set of intensities, right? So this would be take out one little uh, region of this image corresponding to a given cell, and across the 10 channels, I've got the intensity of uh, the fluorescent signal that I recorded across my 10 composite images. So now I've got a vector of length 10. So this is cell number one, cell number one, and this is you know, composite measurements number one through 10. And then I would basically like to sort of uh, solve a problem like this. So pretend I only have one column here in uh, this, this uh, matrix Y. So now that vector that I drew over there on the whiteboard, you can think about as one column here. That's what data I collected. The yellow matrix here corresponds to, um, in the 10 different composite images, which genes were included. So this is 10 by 37, and it's just a binary matrix that says gene number one was in image number one, and gene number two was in image number four, and so on. These gene modules come from the training data. So these are all known. And again, now this column of data, I'm saying, corresponds to the signal intensity in the region of an image corresponding to just one cell. And then I just solve a sparse optimization problem to infer what the values in this W matrix would have been. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic idea, is that this is given because I, these are the data I collected. This is like how I designed my measurements. These are the gene modules from training data. Then I just need to infer the gene module activities. Then what I do is I just multiply those two matrices together, and that gives me how, basically what the signal intensity should have been across all 37 channels. So we can just write it out over here. Again, this is equal to, this is like 10 by 37. This is the matrix A. Uh, and then we have the matrix U, A, Y, U, W. This again designs how, it, this describes how I made my measurements. These are gene modules. I need to learn this. And then I just multiply these two matrices together. So this is now a vector, uh, yes, of length, whatever, however many columns are in there. Okay, so now this is um, 37. If this is uh, one column big, this is like D by one. Right, so now what I did is I took in the 10 composite images for, uh, and the signal intensity at a given cell, and the thing I'm gonna spit out is now a vector of length 37 that tells me what should have the, the signal intensity been for each of the 37 genes um, that I didn't directly measure but was interested in learning. Yeah? So just to be clear, the, the sparsity assumption is not on gene expression individually, it's on modules, yes. modules of gene yeah. expression. Exactly. Can you say a little bit about how you're learning the, <coughs> the modules, the gene modules? Um, kind of any way you please. The way that I do it is just a matrix factorization. It's like a non-negative sparse matrix factorization. But um, I'm not that particular about that. The only thing I really care about is that there should be a small number of non-zeros in like the latent parameters that I'm gonna go infer down the road. And, um, okay. So the, the sparsity of the dictionary is sort of Oh, that's, biologically reasonable and yes. hopefully interpretable. Yes, yes. Okay. It helps these columns be a little bit more orthogonal. Because if it's non-negative, it's hard for them to be super orthogonal. But if they're sparse, they're a little bit more. Yeah. OK, great. So what I just described is totally reasonable and not what I do. Um, but it's <laughs> a little bit easier to describe than what I actually do. What I actually do is to take, we have these images in many fields of view in many tissues. What, what I actually do is similar to this, so that's why I describe this first. So what I do is I take all of these images and 
I build an autoencoder, okay? So now we're gonna go down to some smaller scales. This is a cartoon of how an autoencoder works. Okay, I build an autoencoder. The autoencoder takes a 10 channel image as input and it's going to sort of reduce the representation of that image down to smaller and smaller scales through convolution and pooling operations. So it's gonna try and represent this 10 channel image with a sort of much smaller 10 channel representation. Okay, so if this was, for example, 2048 pixels by 2048 pixels, it's gonna kind of encode 10 channels in whatever, let's say, uh, you know, 128 by 128 pixels or something like that. Then it's going to decode that encoded representation and spit out a 10 channel image that's meant to match the original. So an autoencoder basically takes a signal, represents it in some compact way, in this case it's not required, in some compact way, and then decodes that compact representation to give you what you got back. The reason I'm doing that is as follows. So now what I do, so I just train this autoencoder on my composite imaging data. No sort of decompression done yet, just an autoencoder for images. So now what I do is I, if I want to decompress the 10 channels to get out the 37 channels, I'll take an image, encode it, so now I have a uh, 128 by 128 10 channel encoded representation of a given uh, field of view. And then I basically solve this problem in the encoded representation of a given image. So instead of basically segmenting this image and solving this sort of decompression um, in each segmented region individually, I'm not explicitly segmenting anything at all. I'm letting the autoencoder kind of learn the features that are kind of the salient features of a given image, and then any given node in this sort of encoded representation here, um, effectively, I structure like the number of layers such that any given node here has the view of about one cell's worth of pixels. And then I, again, I just decompress from there. So that wasn't super clear, but in the end what's happening is that I'm taking the encoded representation of a 10 channel image, I'm learning by solving this decompression problem, what the encoded representation of the 37 channel image would have been. So I go from 10 channel small representation to a 37 channel small representation. And then I run the 37 channel encoded representation of my images through the decoder to spit out what the full images should have been, yeah. So do the latent parameters of the autoencoder generalize to other tissues or do you have to, do you have to rerun this per tissue? I rerun it per tissue, but it's no big deal. The autoencoder has like, um, it's, I mean, it's features. It's not like the locations exactly, but it's, it's got like a thousand parameters or something, and it's super quick to learn. It doesn't require a whole lot. Yeah? Uh, I'm a little bit confused because usually in uh, variational autoencoders, the number of channels increases as you, your representation changes. So if you start from a 2048, 2048 with 10 channels, yes. I would expect that when you go... Yeah, so I'm not convolving across channels. Kind of, yeah. So like all my convolutions are, are done independently on each channel, but the filters are shared across all the channels. Okay, so I learn one filter and I apply it to all the channels, um, but I don't convolve across the channels. Yeah. What is the decoding by you? Like why? Oh, um, because the, the other option is that I could like solve this problem pixel by pixel. That's kind of the naive option. So I would take, 
but the, the assumption of this sort of modularity of gene expression applies at kind of the level of cells. Yeah. Pixel by pixel, it doesn't make sense to apply that thing. And so we need to do it, we need to somehow aggregate the intensity from multiple neighboring pixels in a way that is sort of uh, kind of like morphologically aware. Yeah. So this is my way of like, without having to explicitly segment cells, which is actually very hard to do in dense tissues, I just learn um, aggregates of pixel, local pixel intensity in a way that's kind of, you know, image aware, that, that's detecting features that are relevant for that actual image. So now I'm no longer solving it pixel by pixel, I'm solving it roughly at the level of one cell's worth of pixels all summed together according to however the convolutional filter said they should have been summed together. Yeah? That makes sense, but what if you have a tissue in which there are cells of very different sizes? Well, that's exactly why I do, oh yeah, if there are many, many different sizes, you could solve this at different layers if you please. I, I haven't done that yet. Is, is the one cell's worth of information sort of futuristic? Yeah. To... yeah. I mean, you could, you could solve this at, you could solve it at multiple layers simultaneously, or you could, one could also play around with, so far it hasn't been mega sensitive to like how many layers I have in here. For example, if I have one fewer layer, which would effectively, <coughs> effectively in my case, double the field of view for any given node here, it doesn't affect it massively. Um, so, you know, if you had cells that are 100 times bigger, then it might be a little bit more challenging. But cells that are within a factor of two, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be like that sensitive that you nail exactly the field of view of any given um, node in this layer. Yeah? So do you expect that if someone were to put in like all of the engineering effort to like specifically segment by cells and then aggregate in that way before deconvolving, that that would do better than, than no. this? No. I mean, it would do better in a talk. That's why I did it first. I don't, I don't think it would do better. I think it's do, I mean, it's a very good thing to do for debugging the process because I can go cell by cell and when I get something wrong, I can look at specifically the coefficients for that cell and say, okay, decompression algorithm, what's the matter you with this cell? And here I can't do that. So the debugging and the, and the development is harder. So it's, it's certainly sensible to do it like that. But in terms of like the power that that method has versus this, I don't, I don't see why that should do any better. And the results here look reasonable. I, if you had an absolutely perfect cell segmentation algorithm, I, you know, maybe, I don't know, but such a thing doesn't exist. The other thing that this allows me to do is down the road, I could also leverage the fact that not only are gene expression patterns structured within dissociated individual cells, but they're obviously also structured spatially, right? Um, and this allows me at some point conceptually to leverage both the fact that within single cells, you have kind of gene modular expression, but then you also have spatial module expression, which would be basically recognized at different layers of this sort of architecture. Yes? I think this is very naive, but um, I, I'm not sure I understand how you do the decompression to the 37 genes, because it, it seems like you wouldn't have a training data to go from that compressed representation to the 37. Well, does it make sense in the cell segmentation case, or no? Okay. What about in, okay, all right. Yeah, maybe because I don't quite get what. All right, ask me after. So that's the plan. Uh, so the first thing we did was <clears throat> just simulate, suppose that we could actually collect composite images. Um, could we actually decompress them running this sort of algorithm? So what we did was we, we had a data set from some collaborators at the NIH where in one tissue section, this is measuring proteins now, they had actually measured 13 different gene abundances. So this is sort of like ground truth. They had 13 images. Then what I did was I came up with uh, six different compositions. So gene one, gene two, whatever, whatever, whatever. 
um, and this is a different composition. And I just merged the 13 images together computationally. So this is like, literally, if you took the image for gene one and just smashed it together with the image just like my composite slide earlier um, with gene two, gene three, and so on, okay? So now this was the, Im I hide this data. This is the input to my algorithm um, in each uh, basically small encoded representation uh, region of the image, I sort of take the six-channel image and decompress it to get the encoded representation of the 13-channel image, run through that, that through the decoder, and it spits out these images, which nicely match the original images. So that's just sort of a computational proof of principle that says if we could actually collect composite images in the lab, uh, then we have some hope of decompressing them. Then we actually went and collected some composite images. Um, so I already showed this slide before, but um, in red shown here, um, I actually took uh, individual images for all of these genes and merged them together computationally, just like on the previous slide. Okay, so in this tissue section, we actually individually imaged all of these genes. And I just merged those images together, and that's what's shown in red. We also generated the composite image by just throwing green probes, not actually, but you know, uh, green probes for all of these things together at the same time. Um, and that's what's shown in green. Um, and then we have just the nuclei labeled in blue. And um, largely what you see is that they match up. So, uh, red plus green equals yellow, and all these big yellow blobs are where the merged images from all these genes match the actual composite data that we collected. So um, certainly not perfect, but a relatively good match. Yes? Do you have a sense of how sensitive this is to the linearity of the fluorescent protein response? Well, so, oh, right, I should also say these are now RNA levels. Yes, I mean... It matters actually a lot more for when you're measuring proteins because the dynamic range of expression can be much greater than it can be at the RNA level. And uh, we think it definitely matters because, you know, when you're just, if you, for example, set the intensity um, when you're collecting the data such that you're sensitive to a very lowly abundant gene, then you're just going to get blasted out anytime you see a very highly abundant gene. And so ultimately, it's going to matter that we deal with that technically, and we have some strategies molecularly to normalize the signals such that they're in the same range. For now, what we try and do in a pilot experiment just to demonstrate the basic idea is choose genes that are not, you know, three orders of magnitude apart in terms of their expression. Um, yep. So it looks like you recover things really, really well. But there ah, are no recovery here yet. This is just the composite image. We'll show the recovery and then say that. Yeah, but in the previous <laughs> slide, <laughs> yeah. you showed really good. Yeah. Results, oh, right? yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's pretend I was talking about this one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but there are some differences. Can you do you have a characterization of the differences so that when we interpret the recovered images, we don't accidentally see patterns that aren't there? Yeah. Here it's actually um, a lot of the image, a lot of the differences that you can see in these two come down to just a sort of quantitative um, question, like the, the locations are actually quite accurate, um, and it's really that basically the contrast is different between the two images. So quantitatively, it's not exactly getting the signal intensity, but if you kind of just binarize both of them, they, they look very similar. And actually that's, you know, here this is even the channels are binarized, for example. So even if you, because it's sort of hard to, when you, when you process the images, the raw data um, need to be massaged a little bit before um, you can actually see anything. So for example, if you just, if you, if you haven't adjusted the contrast at all or subtracted out the background from an unstained image and you just look at the raw data for any given individual gene, for many of them, you just, it looks like just a blank field. You don't see anything. And so they've all been, for instance, as I said, contrast adjusted to sort of bring out the signal and smash down the noise around some threshold. 
And when you do that, you, you, you zip everything through some nonlinear function like that, it makes it hard to recover the exact quantitative level of everything. So you've essentially taken a bunch of the signal and pushed it to one and a bunch of the other signal and pushed it to zero. Um, and you've done that both in your composite image and individual genes and everything. And so it's hard to know where you were between zero and one exactly. So a lot of the differences are due to the fact that we don't even attempt really to be exactly accurate um, on the full quantitative value. Okay, so here are some actual recovered images um, next to these same sort of um, uh, in situ hybridizations that I've shown. So uh, here are, this is from the Allen Brain Atlas. So this is um, three different genes that were measured just to give you a sense of their kind of overall relative abundance and their spatial expression patterns. This is expressed primarily in the outer cortical layers and this is expressed everywhere. These are um, three of the 37 genes that we recovered that are the same and you can see that they basically have the same uh, spatial expression patterns. So, um, and when you merge them all together, they are indeed marking different cells which they're supposed to be in this case. So that looks pretty good. That was from an initial experiment where actually we recovered 37 genes from nine composite images from, because one of them failed. Um, we repeated the experiment where in each tissue section, we measured the 10 composite images, but then also did like an extra round of imaging to directly measure a few of the genes individually. So not all 37, but a couple of them. Okay, so just to repeat that, in a given tissue section, we collected 10 composite images and also images for, let's say, four different individual genes. So now we have the opportunity to validate those directly in the same tissue. Here's, I'll show you some genes that worked and some genes that work less well, it's very much work in progress. Um, so these are marking different cell types. The, in red, I'm showing the genes that were um, measured directly in green is the same gene, um, but where it was recovered from the 10 composite images and the nuclei are labeled in blue. Yeah, maybe that's slightly better. So for um, genes that are very highly expressed, it's quite easy to see, and generally we do a better job of those, um, perhaps unsurprisingly. So yellow, again, is where we basically got it right. Um, this. This is also kind of a red shade of yellow, just so you know, it's just less abundant. And these are, again, marking different cell types. Um, and then in some cases, we get a lot of it right, but perhaps we also, there's a few green spots where we um, predict some extra cells that have that. Then there are genes where it's a little bit less clear if we got it right. Some cases, it looks like it might just be, um, you know, perhaps like a registration type of issue. So we have in here, some, in some fields of view, they look very nicely registered, so you have a bunch of yellow. And in other fields of view, we see kind of recurrently that they're maybe just shifted by a little bit. So that doesn't bother me as much. Things that some genes are not very highly expressed, so it's you know, kind of hard to know if you see a little green speck without a little red speck. I don't know if it's right or wrong. And some genes, uh, basically we had sort of no signal from directly measuring the gene but the uh, sort of decompressed um, image suggests that we should have observed that gene everywhere. Um, I should say that we know that this particular gene is expressed in about 15% of the cells in this region of the brain. So the direct measurements say it's expressed in 0%. The recovered measurements say it's expressed in something like 15%. But still, it's hard to know if that's exactly right. Yeah. Regarding the registration issues, uh, shouldn't the max pooling and the autoencoder kind of make you a little bit more robust to channel registration? I suppose, but I mean, you still, like I said, it, it'll still give you things like this, where even if we're robust in some sense, um, it'd be nice if this was yellow instead of green next to red. Um, so it still does seem to wiggle around a little bit. Okay. Um, okay, right. So that's basically, there's tons of work left to be done. 
on that, it, both on the algorithmic end and on the sort of molecular end of generating the data in the first place. Um, so we're excited to um, start to clean up a lot of that, advance a lot of that, and eventually to scale it up a bunch, both to apply it um, to larger scales of measuring RNA and also to protein. Um, and then I'm not going to talk about it because we're out of time now, but all of these same mathematical ideas and concepts for collecting data can be applied to learning about cell circuitry. Um, and as I described very briefly, um, the, the sort of equivalent way of collecting composite data there is to do experiments that tell you kind of the average outcome of multiple individual experiments. And there's different ways of doing that. We're interested in applying that to study sort of combinatorial effects in different signaling pathways. Um, so you can come talk to me, which is only 50 slides too many. Uh, and then finally, just to wrap up again, I'd like to thank uh, various people who actually do all the work um, in multiple labs, including in Faye's lab, Evan and Anu and Faye, in the Lander Lab, Brooke and um, Hassan and John in the Regif Lab. And thank you uh, also for listening. <laughs>